Coca-Cola spends billions of dollars on advertising each year, yet will never try to sell you on their products. They promote the concept of happiness, peace, and unity, yet some would argue that it is a distraction from the disturbing reality. There are very serious allegations that the company has caused disease, droughts, exploitation, and much worse. So strap in. We're embarking on a journey through Coca-Cola's fascinating history, which spans three centuries. We'll look at how Coca-Cola become one of the most well-known brands in history, and at what cost. Back in the 1880s, there was a bit of a revolt against doctors, and people began adopting home cures instead. A slew of deceptive entrepreneurs jumped on this opportunity and began developing potions and elixirs that they claimed had numerous medical benefits. The truth was that they were generally harmful, ineffective combinations of various chemicals, but because there was no regulation, they could claim whatever health benefits they wanted, and therefore business was thriving. Then Mariani was a popular patent medicine that featured a blend of wine and cocaine that reportedly treated practically any condition or sickness if you drank three glasses every day. And one man who truly enjoyed this drink was a man named John Pemberton. He was a war veteran who had been gravely injured in battle, and the doctors thought he was going to die. They gave him morphine to try to mask the pain in his final hours, but John miraculously survived. Vin Mariani, on the other hand, caused him to acquire a significant morphine addiction. He did feel better after drinking it, but not because it was medicinal. It was due to the presence of liquor and cocaine. But because he liked the drink and was a scientist, he decided to make his own version. To be fair to Pemberton, he was wasn't a salesman on to scam people. He was a firm believer in his product. However, Pemberton's timing was awful because prohibition hit barely a year later, with many states outlawing alcohol. Pemberton had to remove the wine from his drink and replace it with carbonated water, which left the drink tasting bitter, so he added a lot of sugar to compensate. He could continue selling the drink now that the wine had been eliminated, but they needed a new name. Fortunately, Pemberton's bookkeeper, Frank Robinson, came up with a memorable suggestion, Coca-Cola. The corporation would later say that the name has no meaning and is simply a catchy alliteration. Of course, this is not the case. The name referred to the drink's two key ingredients, caffeine containing cola nuts and cocaine containing coca leaves. Coca-Cola was average advertised in the early 1900s as a superb brain tonic that relieved headaches and upset stomachs. However, sales were slow because there were so many other patent medicines offering the same thing that Coke didn't really stand out. Just before his death, Pemberton sold the company for $2,300 to an ambitious workaholic named Asa Candler, who then began buying out other people's shares in order to gain complete control of the company. Candler may not have purchased all of those shares, according to further examinations, because some of the paperwork had fake signatures. Candler had all of the company's early records burnt to cover his tracks, so we'll never know what really happened. Candler was entirely in command of the company by the 1890s. He began plastering the town with Coca-Cola-branded banners, billboards, and posters. They also painted the Coca-Cola logo on barns and basically plastered it on everything. As a result, people began to notice the logo everywhere they went. Then they began giving away free samples of the drink. The rationale was that by offering a free sample, individuals would become lifelong customers, especially because the drink included numerous addictive substances. However, it quickly became evident that marketing Coca-Cola as a treatment was a bad idea. Rather than solely marketing to the sick, they could advertise to everyone by framing it as a delightful, calming drink that anybody might enjoy. This had the extra benefit of distancing Coca-Cola from the patent medicine industry, which would shortly come under fire as it was shown that most of their claims were utter frauds. Coca-Cola's mass marketing technique was a big success. As the company grew rapidly, Candler poured more money into advertising and even began paying movie stars and athletes to endorse the drink. A large part of Coca-Cola's success has been instilling in people's minds a nice wholesome image of what the drink stands for. What better method to accomplish this than to pay celebrities to promote the drink? Coca-Cola even began showing Santa Claus clutching a Coke in their Christmas ad advertisements, so that young children would associate Coca-Cola with the joy of Christmas. Sounds like a stale marketing strategy, yet Coca-Cola pioneered numerous marketing methods that have since become mainstream. For example, while sex sales may be an advertising cliche these days, relatively few big corporations had made use of it. The drink was first advertised alongside Coca-Cola girls, which were essentially attractive women who usually had a Coke in hand. Coke even established a statistical department to analyze car traffic and people's movement in supermarkets in order to determine the most successful spots to display their advertisements. Coca-Cola was always ready to throw money into advertising as new technology was released, from radios to televisions, to ensure that everyone worldwide knew about its products. Initially, though, Coke was mostly offered at soda fountains. This allowed Coke to save a lot of money 
because they only had to deliver the syrup and then whoever was selling it would combine it with carbonated water. Thus, Coke's shipping and distribution costs were significantly reduced. But then two lawyers named Benjamin and Joseph approached Candler with an idea. They wanted to bottle Coca-Cola. Candler believed this was a terrible idea. Coca-Cola bottling was both costly and complicated, but Benjamin and Joseph stated that they would bear the entire cost and risk themselves. So Candler accepted and signed a contract allowing them complete bottling rights for one dollar. Candler believed he had nothing to lose if the idea of bottling Coke was successful. If it did, he'd simply sell a lot more Coke syrup. As we now know, bottled Coke was an enormous success. This was initially beneficial to Candler because the bottlers were purchasing a large amount of Coke syrup from him. But there was one huge issue. Candler had put almost no thought into the contract he signed since he didn't believe bottling Coke would work. There was no time frame stated and no mention of adjusting the price if the cost of producing the Coke syrup increased. This meant that Asa Candler had given the bottlers an indefinite contract to supply them with Coke syrup at the same cheap price regardless of how much the price of the raw components increased. This would result in numerous lawsuits between Coke and its bottlers over the next several decades. The Coca-Cola firm would end up paying tens of millions of dollars to repurchase some of the rights that Candler had sold for a dollar. However, in the early 1900s, Candler was pleased with the sales of his syrup, which were increasing significantly year after year. The reason for their expansion isn't because Coke is unique. There were other comparable drinks available at the time. The company's rapid expansion, on the other hand, can be credited to its marketing. Coca-Cola spent more money on advertising every year, and sales of Coca-Cola increased every year. However, Coca-Cola's greatest success would come from an unexpected source. When World War II broke out, it was announced that sugar would be rationed. Coca-Cola, on the other hand, made the ludicrous notion that they should be excluded from sugar rationing because Coke was a necessary wartime commodity. Even stranger, the government agreed. This was largely due to Coca-Cola's extensive lobbying of the government. Coke funded numerous studies in an attempt to persuade the government of Coke's benefits. They stated that Coke would raise soldiers' morale and provide an energy boost. Eventually, the U.S. government decided to put a Coca-Cola executive to the rationing board, which then exempted Coca-Cola from sugar rationing while requiring every other corporation to reduce the amount of sugar they used during the war. And it didn't stop there for Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola's president publicly vowed that every man in uniform would receive a bottle of Coca-Cola for five cents, no matter where he was or how much it cost the firm. Coca-Cola would lose money on each drink sold to soldiers if it's sold at this low price. Nonetheless, this decision was brilliant. First, it established a strong link between Coke and the war effort in the minds of the public, particularly troops, and helped Coca-Cola achieve massive popular support and goodwill in the minds of millions of Americans. Coca-Cola took advantage of the occasion to run new wartime advertisements depicting troops folding Coke bottles, but that's not all. Behind the scenes, Coca-Cola had struck an arrangement with the government to get funds to assist them in establishing Coca-Cola bottling operations worldwide. They said it would boost army morale and promote American influence, but what it really meant was that the taxpayer was helping to subsidize Coca-Cola's international expansion during the war. The government supported the establishment of 64 Coke bottling plants on various continents throughout the world. The soldiers were so grateful to Coca-Cola for providing them a taste of home during the horrors of war that they became the drink's most ardent supporters. The United States military essentially turned into a Coca-Cola sales force, introducing new individuals to Coke wherever they went. Coca-Cola was expanding faster than ever before around the world. Only two countries in the world do not sell Coke as of today, Cuba and North Korea. Coke's quick global development throughout the globe was largely due to the bargains it made during the war. However, there is one minor issue. Throughout the war, the Coca-Cola firm also supplied Nazi Germany with Coke. Coca-Cola was even distributed and advertised in Nazi educational booklets during Hitler's youth rallies. As the war proceeded, limitations were imposed that shut off most multinational firms' supply of various items to Germany. This meant that they could no longer sell their wares to Germans. However, Max Keith, the leader of Coca-Cola's largest bottling factory in Germany, had an idea to overcome these limits. He commissioned local chemists to make a new drink that was roughly similar to Coke, but instead of using Coke syrup, which could no longer be imported, it was made from leftover bits from other food products, such as apple fiber. This new drink was eventually named Fanta, and because so many other beverages were prohibited due to the war, Fanta became a major hit in Nazi Germany. According to some stories, Keith used forced labor from concentration camps to help create it. Of course, we know that at the end of the war, all of the revenues from the new Fanta drink were returned to the Coca-Cola headquarters, and Max was promoted within the Coca-Cola firm. By 1955, Coca-Cola was selling Fanta, 
in over 100 countries worldwide. Coca-Cola will try to convince you that their most important secret is the drink formula, which is kept in a high security vault. But the formula isn't that important. It's available on Wikipedia. Of course, the formula has very little to do with Coca-Cola's success. You might be able to make a clone product in your kitchen, but you'll never be able to compete with them. Let's have a look at why. One day, a teacher at a new school suggested to the principal that the school vending machines include some healthier options, such as fruit drinks. She was shocked to learn that it would not be possible due to the school's exclusive arrangement with Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola paid the school $3,000 every year, or around $1 per pupil, to dictate whatever product the school sold. Contracts like these were apparently negotiated with a plethora of other schools as part of Coca-Cola's strategy. According to one Coca-Cola marketing executive, it is much easier to transform someone into a lifelong cult customer while they are young than when they are older. Coca-Cola also spent millions of dollars lobbying state governments to oppose sugar taxes and stricter nutrition requirements. They allegedly struck deals behind closed doors to donate to particular politicians' campaigns in exchange for a special treatment for Coca-Cola. They also continued to pour billions of dollars into the sponsorship of athletes and important sporting events in order to create the appearance of a link between excellent athletic performance and Coca-Cola. France also stated that contaminated Coke sickened over 100 people and briefly banned their products. The corporation was accused of being slow to respond to any of these issues and of not taking the problem seriously enough. Coke was accused in India of poisoning groundwater with wastewater. Coke admitted to having a wastewater problem, but claimed to have resolved it. However, later testing revealed residues of toxic sludge still present underground. After being elected, Mexico's president began favoring his former company, and throughout his office, he granted Coca-Cola 27 water concessions, which many claim allowed Coke to damage water and even take indigenous people's water. Of course, Coca-Cola has always needed massive amounts of natural resources to succeed. In fact, it is the world's largest importer of sugar. As the 1990s approached, Coca-Cola experimented with a new sort of vending machine that increased the price of Coke based on how hot it was outside. Coke also forced distributors to buy more syrup than they required at the end of quarters to make its earnings look greater than they really were in order to increase sales figures and deceive investors. However, the anti-Coke response peaked in 2003 when a campaign named Stop Killer Coke claimed that Coca-Cola was responsible for the murder of union members working in Coke bottling factories in Colombia. Coke denies this, and the exact reality remains uncertain. Despite all the controversy, Coke is still adored by people all over the world. In many ways, Coca-Cola is built on an image that must be constantly reinforced because, while you can hear about Coke's disastrous influence on children's health, their lobbying of governments, and the innumerable controversies they try to brush under the rug, does it really make a difference? Coca-Cola promotes itself as an old friend who isn't going anywhere anytime soon.